Okay, an increase in COVID-19 variant infections, a delay in vaccine delivery, and concerns as the provinces slowly reopen. Contagious variants have now been found in every province, prompting fears of a third wave of COVID-19. Meanwhile, many provinces are still concerned about a vaccine shortage. A shipment from Pfizer expected today with 3.1 million doses expected by March 31st. Canada's chief public health officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, urging Canadians to stay vigilant and she joins us now. Good morning to you, Dr. Tam. Good morning. Thank you for joining. I want to begin here with the variants because it's all anyone's talking about other than the vaccinations, of course. And you've been very outspoken about them and the dangers of them. Will you be releasing any new modeling to give Canadians a picture of what we really could be dealing with? Um, that's a very timely question because I'll be doing that tomorrow morning. So, absolutely. But basically, the bottom line is... Um, the modeling will show that uh, these variants uh, are more easily spread, but public health measures can work, uh, but we need to keep at them. Uh, if you let them and ease them off too quickly uh, and you have a variant in your midst, uh, you're, you're looking at an, another resurgence, basically. So that's the bottom line. And so um, hold, hold tight and be vigilant. Uh, hold tight on those public health measures. Dr. Tam, just how concerned should Canadians be and how transmissible these variants are? You, you know, is this um, surfaces? Is it something that lingers within the air and not having that two meter contact that we've always been hearing about? How concerned should we be? And what kinds of settings are we seeing the spread? So we're still learning quite a bit about uh, these new uh, variants, what we call variants of concern. The virus, of course, mute, is mutating. And, um, and the more virus there is, the more interaction um, there are between people, the virus will undergo mutations on an ongoing basis. But we're concerned uh, about a few of them um, because these viruses um, appear to be more easily spread between people. So these are more transmissible viruses. Even more concerning is that some of them might impact the effectiveness of the vaccine um, and uh, we are monitoring very closely, mainly through international data, um, on whether some of them could cause more severe illness as well. There were some data um, coming out of the uh, United Kingdom, which suggests that the B117 variant initially reported uh, from the UK uh, may actually be um, causing some more serious illness as well. So that's why. Uh, we are extremely uh, vigilant about those, trying to detect um, them through laboratory testing, for example. Um, so that's why uh, there's a great deal of interest in scientific uh, um, um, studies on all of them. Dr. Tan, we've got a lot of kids back in school now. Are you concerned that there could be transmission within these settings uh, that we might not even be knowing about? So um, we're learning, as I say, more about these variants, but uh, I think it's uh, pretty evident that in, the, uh, in, in Canada, uh, the B117 uh, variant is actually quite widespread. It's been reported in 10 provinces. And there's many different settings where outbreaks um, associated with this new variant has occurred, long-term care facilities. Some have occurred in schools uh, or, or in um, school age uh, populations um, and also uh, in other settings as well. Uh, Newfoundland, I have to remind people, Newfoundland has been doing very well with um, COVID-19, uh, extremely um, d uh, vigilant and doing everything it can to keep the virus out of the province, just uh, had a large outbreak. Um, it's currently had experience that in St. John's. And um, that uh, is believed to be started um, in a younger population, socializing uh, in sort of sports events, that type of thing. So, of course, if the interactions occur in those settings, the virus could, can be transmitted. What we do know is that there, there, there tends to be a difference between the younger sort of elementary school kids and the older kids. The older kids are more like adults, sort of the youth. And so transmission dynamics are probably um, similar. So you have to be very careful when you uh, re-enter the classroom that all the different measures are in place um, to reduce spread as much as possible. Um, and for the younger kids, uh, the latest uh, study coming out of the United Kingdom suggests that they, even with the new variant, they experience milder illness. 
That doesn't mean they couldn't get, some of them couldn't get more severeness, but it, that's that um, sort of observation mm -hmm. uh, in kids seems to be the similar between the older viruses and the newer variants. Dr. Tam, are you, with, with kids back in school, with reopenings across various provinces, are you anticipating a third wave and for us to go backward at any point in the near future? That is a distinct possibility. And that's why I've been messaging, um, uh, you know, pretty widely in terms of um, keeping uh, interactions um, to a minimum. So, so I've been saying, you know, uh, people should, as much as possible, uh, have the fewest interactions with the fewest people for the shortest time at the greatest distance. Of course, there are, um, in, in situations where you can't avoid that, then, of course, layer on uh, all the personal protective measures. And, you know, you, you asked at the beginning about, you know, how many minutes and what distance. Well, what I've just said is keep the longest, you know, the biggest distance you can for the shortest time. And so that, with the variants, that is still holds. And they, these measures do work. Um, so, but if you can uh, figure the fact that uh, our population, the vast majority is not immune. Uh, we've seen that in uh, studies of antibodies in Canadians across the country, which means that if you don't have these measures in place and you don't have rapid, you know, good testing, tracing and isolation um, capacities in place, it comes, you know, if the variant comes in, it's going to take off. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's talk about the elephant in the room, and that is the vaccination rollout, because vaccines play a big role in us tackling COVID-19. Um, just looking at some University of Oxford data that, ca that came out recently. So it's interesting when you see Canada and the U.S. started vaccinating same time, but we are well behind our neighbors to the south when it comes to at least per capita vaccination. I believe, according to Oxford universities, we are sitting 40th in the world. Um, we're waiting on AstraZeneca, that approval from Health Canada. We heard over two weeks ago that it was imminent. Do you have an update on when this may be approved? Well, I'm not part of the regulatory um, um, area that it belongs to Health Canada. And we must let the regulator do its job in terms of reviewing the data because they're there to ensure that we have all the checks and balances in terms of effectiveness and safety. So, um, you know, I've heard that they, it's, it's, they, they're on, it's ongoing, basically, and they're working as fast as they can. And the data is evolving. So I think that's part of the reason as well. Uh, but uh, I, I, I really uh, support uh, people letting the regulator do the best job possible. And we've got a lot of questions, actually, about the research that is underway and whether or not kids will be able to get this vaccine soon. Um, do you know much more about that research and where that's progressing? Well, I think right now some of the clinical trials are now scoping in uh, kids, younger kids, um, which means that, um, you know, they, they should be available in a, a number of months. As, as you know, the vaccine rollout right now is targeting to provide vaccines to all Canadians uh, by September, which means that uh, you know, some of the priority groups have to come first, the highest risk, uh, including the elderly, including those in long-term care, and those who are in the front lines of healthcare. But you will see the prioritization uh, um, sort of move ahead. And then kids, once we get that data, uh, of course, will be scoped in possibly towards the end of that period. Okay, I want to get to a few viewer questions because we have received many um, and a lot of them have to do with the vaccinations. So uh, this tweet coming to us saying, is Canada already preparing for possible booster shots in 2022, like many European countries? Because a lot of people have questions about, um, you know, are you going to need another shot? Is it going to be something like the flu shot where you have to do it on a, on a yearly? And with that, are we procuring these booster shots? So this is an extremely important question and it's one that is uh, relevant to the world not just Canada and so um, absolutely I think manufacturers are already looking at some of the new variants and how the virus is evolving and adapting some of the vaccines the research is already beginning in that area by a, a range of manufacturers so um, with the mRNA vaccines, for example, that, that, that technology, that scientific breakthrough allows these vaccines to be adapted uh, in a relatively fast way. 
So that's good news, and they're already working on, uh, on that. The regulatory authorities, as I said, not just Health Canada, the regulators of the world are looking at, well, how do we approve these vaccines, which is essentially an adaptation of the existing vaccines as fast as we can. So they're looking for the regulatory pathways to ensure that these new um, um, variations, if you like, on the mm -hmm. vaccine are also effective and safe. So everyone's working towards that. I, I don't have the crystal ball ahead of me, but um, with uh, every country in the world uh, having experienced um, this virus, this new coronavirus, it's very unlikely that you can get rid of this virus very fast. So it's vigilant monitoring, analyzing what this virus is doing, and I think adapting vaccinations accordingly. So I think this is an evolving area of um, uh, science and uh, of course we'll keep the public updated as we have that information. Uh, Dr. Tam, because it is the topic of our conversation here in Sound Off, very quickly I just wanted to ask you about this double masking and, and you, I, I know it's not officially recommended at this point uh, from uh, the government. Uh, what is your take on double masking or, or single mask, triple layer? What are you recommending for the public? So let's just remember that masks are just one layer of protection. You have to do all the other things, including the distancing and avoiding those closed, crowded uh, areas inside where you're going to be close to people. If, that, if you can't avoid those, then do all the additional layers, including masking. So what we recommend, and we put up some new recommendations that just updates um, for the public on um, the uh, Canada.ca slash coronavirus website. We are recommending, um, and we, we did since November, a triple layer mask, so the two layers of cotton, for example, with a filter uh, layer. So, but the most important thing is a well-constructed, well-fitted mask. The fit is really important. So it doesn't matter how many layers you put on. If the fit isn't good, you cover your nose down to your chin and that the mask is well fitted all around, then you lose the performance of that mask. It also has to be breathable. So the United States and maybe other countries recommended uh, that if you wear a surgical mask, a like medical mask, they often gate at the sides. Mm -hmm. So there's techniques to make them more well fitted, one of which is of course, you can potentially put a cloth mask on top, but the bottom line is it's got to be well constructed, well fitted and worn properly. It's no use having any number of masks if you're wearing under your chin, for example. So I think that it is an ongoing practice of perfecting uh, our abilities to uh, everyone in wearing a well fitted, well constructed mask. Okay, Dr. Tam, thank you for uh, spending your morning with us uh, and we appreciate your time. I know you've got a uh, busy, busy schedule ahead and we'll be staying tuned for the modeling data to come out from you tomorrow. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. You too. All right, Devo Brown, did that answer all your questions? That answered so many questions. <laughs> Mel, Dr. Tam, thank you so much. So no chin diapers, basically, is what we're saying here with the masks. You need to actually put them and cover your face. That's what you got to do. Look, at teachers helping teachers with wellness and workouts. We're going to meet a teacher who started this, and they're going to get us moving this morning as well. We cannot wait to get that workout going. So get up if you can, get stretched out. We'll get moving next.